Ephesians chapter 1, I'll begin reading at verse 1, read to verse 6, and we'll get into our study. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. And so I'm going to give to you, uh, as I normally do when I begin a study, a, uh, a bit of a prolonged uh, introduction and uh, share a few things with you concerning uh, this book that we're about to embark on an in-depth study of. Ephesians is a letter that intends to encourage believers to know who they are in Jesus Christ. It's a book that is filled with promises that God has given to his children. In this book, Paul reveals his shepherd's heart for these people. He begins this letter by calling to their memories that they have been blessed by God. Notice verse 3. He points out that Jesus has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He begins this way because he's concerned for them. These people that he's writing to, these Ephesians, are spiritually rich, yet they're living as if they were spiritually bankrupt. And that's because they don't yet understand how blessed they are in Jesus Christ. They have yet to understand that God has provided for them in every way. Several years ago now, the LA Times reported the story of an elder, elderly man and his wife who were found dead in their apartment. Autopsies revealed that both had died of severe malnutrition, although investigators had found a total of $40,000 stored in paper bags in a closet. Today, there are many Christians who are spiritually living below where they could be living. So Ephesians reveals our riches in Christ and teaches us who we are in Him. You see, Pastor Paul wants all believers for all time to know that they are rich in Jesus Christ. And the church, including us, should know that we are rich beyond measure in Jesus. In Ephesians, the word riches is used five times. Grace is used 12 times. Glory is used eight times. And in Christ, or its equivalent, around 35 times. So Paul obviously intends to instruct the church on how to understand the work that God has performed on our behalf when he gave his son Jesus Christ to die on a cross for us. Now, this kind of understanding of what Christ has done, what he's accomplished, what he has given to us, this kind of understanding takes place through the teaching as well as the application of the word of God. You see, in our day, such a discipline of actually being taught and applying is not really that attractive to every Christian. There's a growing number who actually resist Bible teaching because for them, Bible teaching is boring. Some of the things that they may hear even disturbs them, and it makes them uncomfortable. They don't realize that that is falling into a prophetic word that God gave through the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4 at verse 3, when he said, A time will come when people will not listen to accurate teachings. Instead, they will follow their own desires and surround themselves with teachers who will tell them what they want to hear. He speaks of satisfying their own desires. What they do is they seek those who will satisfy their desires and support the errors that they hold. And many churches today have discarded teaching the word and promote other things because they're aware of this. This has given rise to what has been called cafeteria Christians. Many have turned away from the riches of God's word and are instead in a constant search for contentment in shallow human teachings. And this reveals that they have yet to understand what Christ promised to his followers. In John 4, 13 and 14, Jesus said, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst. But the water that I will give him will be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And they don't understand that. 
They don't understand John 6, 35, when Jesus said, I'm the bread of life, and he who comes to me will never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. Well, the Ephesians needed to be reminded of what they have in Jesus, and I believe the church today needs to be reminded also. So let me give you a background here of this book. Jesus commanded his ministers to take the gospel throughout the world in Matthew chapter 28, as well as other passages. So in obedience, Paul came to the city of Ephesus. It's recorded in the book of Acts in chapter 18, verses 18 through 21. He came to Ephesus on what is called his second missionary journey. Now, when you look at the city of Ephesus, and I believe I have some pictures of it, Ephesus was one of the most beautiful cities of the ancient world. It was on the southwest coast of Turkey and was a commercial center of ancient Asia Minor. During what is called the Roman occupation from 129 B.C. to 262 A.D., the city swelled to over 250,000 people. It was the second largest city and cultural center in the Roman Empire next to Rome itself. Ephesus was famous for magic, its harbor, and one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Temple of Diana. It is estimated that the temple measured approximately 377 feet long by 180 feet wide. Using an American football field for perspective, the layout of the temple was longer and wider than a standard-sized field. It was considered the first Greek-style temple to be, to be made completely of marble and was built with more than 100 marble columns standing 40 feet high. The entire project took over 120 years to complete. Kind of like the work they're doing here on the street. <laughs> you notice how long that's taken? They, they built uh, the Empire State Building in less than a year. Now, when, when Paul... Oh, by the way... I've been to Ephesus. Marie and I have been to Ephesus on two different occasions. I, I believe that there were pictures being shown so that you could see uh, the city. I, apparently, I, I think they were. Yeah, like there's the temple right there and all of that. Uh, we, I've been there. Uh, obviously, the ruins. They have, a, they have an amphitheater there that seats 25,000. And uh, they're using it now for rock concerts. It's kind of amazing. And... Um, and they have a library, the Library of Celsus. It was one of the largest libraries of the ancient world. It contained between 12,000 and 15,000 scrolls. Again, I mentioned the amphitheater. It seated 25,000. It also had um, the most advanced aqueduct systems in the world. And so when Paul entered the city, the first thing he would do is he would go into a synagogue. In Acts chapter 18, 19, 19 through 21, it speaks of how Paul first came into the city of Ephesus. And in that passage, Luke revealed that he, he was reasoning in the Jewish synagogue, which is what he would do by habit. And he would go and speak to them about the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he first did that, he, he received a welcome and was asked, actually asked to stay longer, but he wouldn't do it. Instead, what he did is he left two of his fellow ministers behind, a man by the name of Aquila and his wife Priscilla, and they remained behind to minister. He came back again on his third mission, and he returned and stayed for three years. And there he laid a very strong foundation. That's found in Acts chapter 20, verse 30, 31. So Paul, when he would come, he would preach. And his preaching had a great impact on the city, but it wasn't always favorable. He had to leave Ephesus after igniting a near riot over the practice of idolatry. You see that in Acts 19. In Acts 19.26, there's a man by the name of Demetrius who was a silversmith who earned his living in making uh, idols and all. And he said, you see in here that not, that not only at Ephesus but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. And so Paul was arrested eventually and uh, was put in jail. When he was in prison, Paul wrote what are called the prison epistles. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon are what are called the prison epistles. And so this book here is one of the prison epistles. Over her history, Ephesus had great teachers 
and great leaders. As we already noted, Paul ministered in Ephesus. Aquila and Priscilla ministered in Ephesus. John, the elder, the one who wrote the Gospel of John, is uh, traditionally believed to have pastored in, in Ephesus, as well as young Timothy. So when you read uh, 1 and 2 Timothy, you're actually reading a letter that is also to the church of Ephesus. And so it was a very influential uh, church that had a, a large impact over time. Um, it was a very significant church. And uh, one other letter that it has that has been written to it is found in the book of Revelation when Jesus wrote his letter to the church of Ephesus, a church that had left its first love. And so this is a letter that is written by Paul to speak to these Ephesians, to let them know what they have in Christ. And you can, if you take the time, which I'd encourage you to do, you can piece together so many things that help you understand what has taken place in this magnificent city, this city that is one of the most beautiful cities in the ancient world, a city that the Apostle Paul came into and poured his heart out to the people of, a church that Paul stimulated a near riot for his proclamation of the gospel, and yet a church that was built, that was, that was blessed, that ultimately had great preachers and teachers, but never listened to the word that Jesus gave it when he said, I have this one thing against you, you're leaving your first love. And so we're going to have an opportunity to look at the book of Ephesians. If you are into um, ways to get a, a, a hold of the, the direction of the church, you can actually divide Ephesians or the letter. You can divide Ephesians using three words into three sections, sit, sit, Walk, stand. That is how you break up Ephesians. Sit, seated in Jesus Christ. Walk, the walk of the believer. And then finally, stand in spiritual warfare. And we're going to be seeing all of those things. Eventually, we're going to be getting to uh, chapter 5. And uh, when we get to chapter 5, that's a chapter that I'm going to take a little time in certain sections because it's a, it's a chapter that deals with... Uh, Christian and, and family, marriage and family. And uh, it's one of my favorite portions of Ephesians as we look at the, uh, the Christian marriage. We'll be seeing that. And I'm going to pray that people in our church will take the time to come, especially for that section, so that we can share with them some things that help us in our marriages. And so with that said, we'll begin now our study here in the book of Ephesians. I'll begin with the introduction found in verses 1 and 2 and then move through until we get to verse 6. So we'll begin with verses 1 and 2. It's uh, actually introduced in the common way that letters were written at that time. It begins with the author of the letter, Paul. It has the secondary, which is to the saints. So the first is the person who's writing. Then secondly, it is to the, the people who are being written. And then third, it's a blessing, grace, and peace. And so he begins, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in uh, Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Typical introduction, salutation, and blessing. Notice as we begin, Paul begins by identifying himself, Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ. This is a typical way that he began letters. In, he begins nine of his letters by, by identifying himself in this way, Paul an apostle. Now, the word apostle literally speaks of one who has been sent out or somebody with authority. Originally, Jesus chose 12 men. He called them his apostles. We know that Judas fell through treachery, and a disciple named Matthias replaced him. You see that in Acts 1.26. Paul became what has been called the 13th apostle, and he was one who was uniquely chosen by God and refers to it in that way because he's an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And so Paul's calling to this position was not from man, and he's pointing that out in his introduction. It was not an appointment from man. It was an appointment by the will of God. You see, man only recognizes the call of God, but it's God who is the one who calls and appoints. It's like John 15, 16, where Jesus said, you didn't choose me. I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, 
that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. You didn't choose me, I chose you in the King James, and I ordained you. Well, Paul is one who says, I was not called an apostle by some vote, by some committee. I am called to be an apostle by God himself. Paul, an apostle by the will of God. My position in calling comes from God. And then he says, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, when he says to the saints, the saints speaks of God's part. Saints are those who have been set apart. The word saint is a common word to speak of a believer. It's used 96 times to speak of believers. There are the saints, but that's God's part. He set you apart. Faithful speaks of man's part. Faithful speaks of man's part in that those who have personally trusted in Christ have exercised faith in him. So God has called you. You have entrusted yourself to him. And so you're saints and you are uh, those who are faithful. And it's been said, either you are a saint or you're an ain't. There's neither. <laughs> you're either or. And so a saint is somebody who's been called by God. It's a common designation. And that's what you, you may not see yourself this way, but I have to tell you, and some of you ought to begin to realize what you are, you have been set apart by God to serve him. If you understand that and live that every day, you're going to grow in the things of the Lord in mighty ways. You have been called by God. There, I've talked to so many people who have said, well, I, I'm no saint. Well, not in the way that human beings use that word, probably not. You're saying you're not perfect, and I get that. You're not. I am. And this is, <laughs> let's just admit that, shall we? No, you're, you're saying you're no saint, but you're trying to say, in fact, that you're still a human being who's moving along the road. I get it. I understand. But from a biblical sense, you've been called by God. And that is a common designation for you. You ought to live up to the name. God has called you and God is using you. What is your part? To be faithful to him. We'll see that in some detail in a moment. But he speaks out in this way to introduce this to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Notice in Christ Jesus. You see, when you're saved, you enter into a living relationship with Jesus Christ. And we know that it's not a religion. It's a living relationship with God himself. And that's what makes us Christians. In John 15, verse 5, it says, I'm the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So we are in the vine, the true vine. We abide in Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. And so we are, we are believers. We are in Christ Jesus. Now, when we forget that we have a living relationship with Jesus Christ, what happens is we can become very religious. And our lives begin to be filled with things that we think we need to do. And when we fill ourselves up with things we need to do, we begin to lose the joy of grace. In Romans 14, verse 17, it says, The kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so in Christ Jesus, we're saved and we are the peace and joy of the Lord. And he wants to remind us of those things immediately. He goes on and he speaks concerning in verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace always precedes peace. And both come from God to those who believe in him. In Romans 5.1, Paul said, Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So he gives a blessing, grace to you, and peace. And then he moves on into the body of his letter, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. We'll look at that for a moment. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. He opens with praise. Because God has been good to us. In Psalm 68, 19, Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits, the God of our salvation. He says, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. 
Now, this is what Jesus promised us as followers. And that includes both Jew and Gentile. He had said in John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Blessed be God who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Notice he says we have every spiritual blessing made available to man. And the gospel reveals these blessings are for those who receive Christ as Savior. When he speaks of spiritual blessings, this is interesting. This word spiritual is an interesting word. It, 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 the word spiritual is a Greek word, pneumatikos. Um, it refers to the working of the Holy Spirit. It, it, it's speaking of the origin of the blessing that believers receive. The origin of the blessings come from God, the Spirit. So if people desire the spiritual blessings of God, they first need to come to Jesus Christ. So to those who by faith come to trust in him, spiritual rest and spiritual blessings belong to them. And that's what Paul is reminding the Ephesians of. Paul is telling the church that God has, now listen, already provided for them what they need. He's already provided. You might want to note that in your heart, if not on a note. God has already provided for you what you need. He is saying they need to make use of what they already have in him. When we understand that, it changes the way that we pray. I heard the story of a man who was an art collector. Perhaps you've heard of this. He was an art collector, and there was a particular painting that he wanted. So he sent one of his, uh, his employees out to seek for this particular painting, and the employee did his due diligence. He, was, he, he hunted the Internet. He did everything he could to find this particular painting this man wanted. The man had a, uh, an amazing art collection, but he, he wanted this one painting. And so after uh, some time, his employee came into his room and spoke to him, and, and the man said, well, have you found the painting? And the employee says, I have, sir. He says, well, where is it? And the employee said, you already own it. This man already owned the painting that he sent someone seeking for. He had so many things, he never even realized the thing that he wanted most was already in his possession. And there were a lot of believers exactly like that. You're always asking God for certain things. Not you, only we ask God, God, I need this. And we forget, wait a minute, he has already supplied those things for me. I'm not accessing them by faith. I already have those things. The things that I'm asking for are things he's already, he has blessed me with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. And yet, why do I constantly go back asking for the same thing that I already have possession of? I'm simply not walking in. Why is that? Well, that's what he's saying. He's saying, you need to know what you have in Jesus Christ. When you received Christ, you were made heir to tremendous spiritual blessings. The Bible says that in Jesus, believers have already been abundantly blessed. And the blessings that we have are spiritual blessings. And they're blessings that originate in heavenly places. Various places in Scripture, you begin to, to read concerning the things that God has provided for us. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, Paul said to the Corinthians, In everything you are enriched by him, in all utterance, in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, he says, He has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In Colossians 2 verse 10, You have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. And Peter in 2 Peter 1.3 said, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. The church already has these things in Christ, but the church isn't living as if they understand they possess that. 
And that's why I was thinking that a good book for us as a church to start the year would be to go through Ephesians to see how God has blessed us and to begin to walk in those blessings that we've already received in him, to learn to do that. He says we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Though we live presently on earth, we are blessed to be citizens of heaven. It's been referred to as dual citizenship. We are sojourners. We are pilgrims. We're living out here, but our real home is heaven. In Philippians 3.20, it says our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, as mentioned, as heavenly citizens, we have what is called a dual citizenship. We're yet to reach our heavenly home, but we still receive blessings from heaven. Many years ago now, I was in Spain. The first time I ever went to Spain was in 1975. And um, I, I went through Europe. I was there for three months. And I went through backpacked Europe with a friend of mine. And uh, we were living on $10 a day. Now, this was back in 1975, so you can imagine um, it, was in, it was an interesting three months. Uh, I, I was already skinny at that time. I weighed 155 when I started. I weighed in two months. I was weighing 145 because we weren't eating. You know, we were walking nine hours a day and, uh, and, and hardly eating anything at all. And so I was down to skin and bone. And so by the time I got to Spain, uh, I, I needed some money. So I wrote home, I called home actually to my mom, and I said, Mama, um, I had left some money in my bank account, and I said, Mama, send me some money. And so my mom sent me some money through American Express, and I went to, Mad in Madrid, I went into the American Express office, and I went up to the counter, and I, and I said, I have money waiting for me, and uh, I'd like to make use of it. And so I was able to take something that was sent from some other place and make use of it at that time. And that's kind of how it is with us, with the blessings God has given to us. We are, we, are, we are residents of heaven, but we live right now on earth. We're pilgrims and we're sojourners. But the blessings God is sending to us are, are blessings that we go and receive. We, we go and make claim to them. They belong to us. They've been sent to us. They are ours. And, and so you have been blessed. I have been blessed by the, spirit, by the Lord. Spiritual gifts and, and, and blessings that come from God, they're from heavenly, uh, heaven, they're of heavenly origin. They're gifts that the Spirit of God has made possible for us. But what we need to do is understand that they are ours and then receive what is ours by faith and say, Lord, I, I, I would like to make access to that. And so he has given to us these things. You have plenty of things, and we're going to be looking through them in some detail. This is just your introduction. But we have these things, and they're blessings from heaven. He points to them for us. Notice in verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So the concept of God choosing, he has chosen us in him, is deeply rooted in Scripture. It is taking the taking of a smaller number out of a larger number. The church has been called or referred to as the called out ones. That's what Ecclesia speaks of, the called out ones. We have been taken out of the world so that we would serve God and become heavenly servants and citizens so he's chosen us he's taken us from the larger the world and he's brought us into relationship with him and you see this concept of choosing i'll touch this very briefly uh in in the bible through the old and the new testament uh, it is seen in god choosing israel uh, this concept of choosing is seen when he chose his prophets his servants and you also see this when jesus chose the apostles in, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, 7 and 8, it says, The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn to your fathers, has the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So the Lord chose you. That he was speaking to Israel. 
As for servants, you see that in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, a prophet, when he said, Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. Before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified you, and I ordained you a prophet to the nation. nations. And then you see um, the apostles, as mentioned in John 15, 16, when Jesus had said, You haven't chosen me, I have chosen you. And so when he says in verse 4, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, God determined all who believed on Jesus would be saved. He didn't choose some to be saved while others he left to be lost forever. Scripture clearly portrays God's desire for all men to be saved. You see that, see that in the most famous New Testament scripture, John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see it in 1 Timothy 2, verse 4, where it says God will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. You see it in the Old Testament book of Isaiah 45, 22, where God says, look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth. And so God has determined that those who believe in Jesus Christ are to be saved. His choosing isn't based on man's logic. It's rooted in his omniscience, his foreknowledge. He knows all possible plans for salvation, and he selected the best. One of the systematic theologians that I will inquire of, very famous one, is named uh, Schaefer, Lewis Berry Schaefer. And Schaefer said this, he said, having a plan and knowing all of its details, God could then foreknow all who would be saved or elected and also all the facts that relate to their salvation. Now that plan would include giving man a freedom of choice for which he would be responsible. God does not violate man's ability to make moral choices that he will be held responsible for. We think immediately of men like Pontius Pilate and Judas Iscariot. They made a willing choice, and they suffered the consequences for doing that. When you look at this in this way that he's speaking of, when he uses the word, he has chosen us, and in verse 5, speaking of predestined us to adoption, when you look at those, those concepts and all, you, you consider the fact that God has, we'll say, omniscience, he knows all things, he has foreknowledge, he knows what will take place. I've always considered his foreknowledge uh, to be like a delayed telecast. Um, I was in line many years ago. Marie and I were going to see a movie, and this was years ago, and there was a contest that had been uh, played between uh, um, two different teams and all, and, and I knew the results of that contest. I already knew the results of it. And there were two little boys, young boys, in front of me standing in line arguing about this particular game. And one was saying, I think that the Rams won, we'll say. The other guy was saying, I think Dallas won. Oh, no. <laughs> so I was there, and I, was, and I knew the result of the game. And so finally, one of the kids said, I'll bet you, I'll bet you that so-and-so won. The other guy knew, I'll bet you this other. I already knew the results. So I turned to one of the kids who was was uh, betting on the Rams, naturally. And I said, bet on the Rams and bet big. Why? Because they won. And, and I knew that already, but this hadn't been televised yet, so these kids didn't know it. And so that's kind of an easy, very simplistic way of looking at it. But I see the Lord as knowing the results of the game before the game is played and anybody else knows it. God already knows the results. And in his choosing, he chose those who are going to come to him in faith. That just makes sense. It's logical to see that. It's his, in the way that the Lord, uh, he, he sees things. He sees things differently than us. It's like what it says in Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old. For I am God. There's none else. I'm God. There's none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand. I will do all my pleasure. God has a full scope of knowledge, and he makes choices, and he has chosen us to be in his son. Now, God, through his spirit, by the word, 
and by the preaching of the, of the gospel calls people to faith in him. In Psalm 34, verse 8, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts him. Isaiah 2, verse 5, O oh, house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Revelation 22, 17, an invitation. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who hears say, come. Let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. So God does not violate your will. He appeals to it by the gospel and convicts you with the Holy Spirit. He sovereignly calls us. He desires to bless us, and he has a purpose in choosing us. Now, verse 4 tells us the purpose of him choosing us is that we should be holy and without blame before him. When he says we should be holy, we should be separated to him. We should not be part of this world system. When he says we should be blameless, the word blameless means spotless, unblemished. Because we have his nature when you're born again, you should be living a life that reveals that. He chose us that we might be acceptable, suitable, or fit for himself. So in Philippians 2.15, Paul says that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. You see, when you go to work, when you're in your neighborhood, when you're in the store, when you're at the gas station, when you're rolling through that stop sign, Wherever you are, you are a testimony of the grace of God. You are a testimony of the grace of God. God. Um, we ought to always remember that. Because he's chosen us to be holy and he's chosen us to be blameless. We have a purpose. And it's not that you can't live a holy life. And it's not that you can't live a life that is unspotted from the world. You can. Am I saying you can be Perfect? No, of course not. Am I saying that God, by his Holy Spirit, uh, can sanctify you and, and make you more and more like him over time as you yield yourself to him and forsake things that take you away from him? Absolutely. And what is the choice that we should make? To walk in his ways. That's what he has called us to do. And so God intends that for us. Now, in verse 5, he says, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. From the very beginning, God intended to send Jesus to die on the cross for us. Revelation 13, verse 8, speaks of Jesus as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So God has determined that we would become his children through Jesus Christ. And notice he says in verse 5, we have become adopted children of God. Jesus is the only begotten son of God. We have been adopted into his family. Let me share with you a little bit about that as we're about to come to a conclusion. We have become adopted children of God. According to Roman law, the person who had been adopted had all the rights of a legitimate son in his new family and completely lost all rights in his old family. In the eyes of the law, he was a new person. So new was he that even all debts and obligations connected with his previous family were abolished as if they had never existed. When you were brought into God's family, all your debts and obligations, the things that you had done wrong and were sinful in, have been completely forgiven. Can you live that way? We ought to. We ought to. Don't, let me be practical, practical about this for just a moment. Don't give in to your lying heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? If our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows all things. When you gave yourself to Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from how many sins? Cleanses us from all sins. You mean even the sins that I have yet to commit? Um, when Jesus died on the cross, every one of your sins were still yet future. You hadn't even been born yet. 
You hadn't even had opportunity to sin. Yet when he died on the cross, he died for all of your sins. When you came to faith in Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ cleansed you from every stinking sin you've ever committed. Every single one. And this is where the end, amen, this is where the enemy rips the body of Christ up, reminding you of what you've done in the past, reminding you of what you've been, reminding you of how you were. And not only does he do that through your own heart, he can do it through family members or friends. He can do it by those who knew you at one time who say you haven't changed you the same way. And you can be convinced within yourself, yeah, I'm lost, I'm no good, I've never been any different. That's a lie. That is the biggest lie. One of the things that I can tell you as somebody who's walked with the Lord now for quite some time is this. The devil is a liar, but Jesus Christ will never lie. Let God be true and every man a liar. When God says it, it's forever and it's true. And when God said, you're my son or you're my daughter, when God said, I completely forgive you, that is complete. That is it. It is finished. It's over. You're brand new in Jesus Christ. And Paul wants the Ephesians, and, and by application, we want to know that we too are forgiven. We are brand new in Jesus Christ. I'm not what I was. I admit what I've done. That's how I got saved. God forgive me a sinner, but I am not that man anymore. That man is dead. It's like that man is in, in a casket, and that casket has been closed, and it's been placed in the ground, and it was buried when I got baptized. It's done. It's over. It's gone. I'm brand new in Jesus Christ, and we need to understand that. And I remind myself of that. I remind myself of that. I am not what I used to be. I am not a liar. I am not a thief. I am not profane. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not a druggie. I'm none of those things. I'm a moral man in love with Christ, and that's what God has done. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. We need to understand that the church, I think, has forgotten that in many ways. You see, we received a new life in Christ. In Romans 8, 14 through 16, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. You didn't receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. You received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. We are children of God. That word Abba, you go to Israel and you will hear the little children saying that to their dads to this day, Abba. The word Abba is, is, uh, is daddy, is papa. That's what the word means. And so when he says we cry out Abba, that's speaking of a tenderness, that we have a relationship with God. He's like that gentle, loving father perhaps you never had. But he's that. And as you look to him now, he's your daddy. He loves you. Well, the blessed fact is when we receive Christ, now this is powerful, we have God's life in our soul. His spirit gives life to our spirit. We become what Scripture calls partakers of the divine nature. In 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4, the apostle said, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate the word participate speaks of being a joint partner. You may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. While human parents can adopt a child and love them as their own child, but God has imparted to his children his own nature. That's what it means to be born again. John MacArthur, a very orthodox and good teacher, said this. He said, to be saved... To be saved is to have the very life of God in our souls. Alexander McLaren, a, a great cleric of another time, said, The very purpose of Christianity, for which God has sent his Son, and his Son came, is that we poor, sinful, weak, limited, ignorant creatures as we are, may be lifted up into that solemn and awful elevation and receive in our trembling 
and yet strengthen souls, a spark of God. That you may be partakers of the divine nature means more than that you may share in the blessings which that nature bestows. It means that into us may come the very God himself. When you're born again, you are born again, not of perishable seed, but by imperishable, the word of God. And what happens is you become, you, you come to life with the very life of God within you. You have been given his life within you. Now, that means that we become partakers of what God would have us to be, and he dwells within us. Our nature is transformed. You have a new nature. And that new nature is from God. And so that's what makes us children of God. We've been brought into his family through faith in Christ, washed and cleansed. And now his Holy Spirit dwells within us, has given us the new nature. That's what it means to be born again. That's what it means to be a child of God. And now we have his life within us. And that is all according to the good pleasure of his will. So salvation and its blessings accompanying it is what pleases God. And then he goes on in verse 6, and he says it this way as he closes, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. The reason that God has saved us is so that in the end it brings glory to him. His salvation is of grace, and because it is, it eliminates all human boasting. Man cannot save himself, so when he is saved, the glory goes to the God who saved him. 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 29 says, God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not, not important, to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. God's salvation is of grace it eliminates all human boasting, and we have been saved that we might bring glory to the God who saved us. So we are made acceptable by God's grace through Jesus Christ, by his unmerited favor, and that should give us a heart to rejoice and praise him, not only on the face of the earth, but for all eternity. You have been, if you've given your heart to Christ, born again. You have become partakers of the divine nature, God has made you into his child. By faith you received Christ, and to as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become sons of God, even unto those who believed on his name. You gave your heart to Christ. You have gone through the, what is called regeneration. This is a heavy book. We'll be seeing more of this as we go through. But the Holy Spirit has dwelt within you. You have the new nature that has been imparted to you. And the blessings that you now have are blessings that God has secured for you through Jesus Christ. And what we need to learn to do is to walk in those blessings that God has already given to us. And when you begin, and I begin to just say, you know what, as a child of God, I know the Lord has plans for me. And right now it may seem like, uh, like everything's going against, but I know in the end that God will have victory. So I'm going to hold fast and learn whatever lesson I need to learn. Because whatever I go through is conforming me into the image of Christ. No, what, no matter what I go through, at the end, it's going to answer the prayers that I have prayed when I have sincerely said, God, make me like you. So one of the things I've learned to do, and I'll close with this thing, I'm learning to do and have learned somewhat to do, is to give God time to show me what he desires to do. Instead of being impatient, thinking, oh, you didn't move, therefore you, I don't do that. Those who wait on the Lord renew their strength. And so as I wait on the Lord, I say, Lord, I know that you want to do something. I'm going to trust that you will. And even though I don't understand the route that you're taking, I do know that what the result will be is what I've asked of you. I want to be like you. And if this makes me more like you, then whatever it is, may it occur. Because at the end, that's all I want. Because I am being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And if this is the way it's going to happen, then praise you, Jesus. That's the way it's going to happen. And at the end, you look back and you say, all this time that I thought I was abandoned, or all this time, so many times I thought I was alone. In fact, that was not, that was not true at all. God was 
beside me every step of the way. He never abandoned me. He never left me. He never forsook me. He was there carrying me half the time, and I didn't even know it. And that's what happens at the end. And I can share that because, one, Scripture teaches that. And, two, I have lived through that and am living through that now. Now, the Lord is always in charge every step of the way, and he always takes you exactly where you want it to be. And sometimes you didn't even know that's where you wanted to be. And then you go, well, this is what I prayed for, Lord. You see, one last thing. You know, when I first got saved, I used to say, oh, Lord Jesus, I want to get married. I want to be married. Oh, please bring. And so I would pray for a blonde because I like blondes. <laughs> I would pray for blondes. When they walked in the room, I'd say, in Jesus' name, I've Claim that one for me. She will make me happy, O oh Lord. And God had different plans. You know, I wanted a blonde, and, and the Lord said, I'm going to keep her in the oven a little longer than that. <laughs> and he brought me my Marie. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Those who wait on the Lord, God has a way of bringing that which you wanted but didn't know exactly what it was. But it's always the right thing. You know, God has a work he's doing in us, guys. And I think as we go through this book, we're going to begin to open our eyes to some of the wonderful things that he's already done that we just haven't seen yet. I'm excited to go through the book of Ephesians, and we'll pick up next time at verse 7. Our Father, we bless you.